Hey everyone, did you know, according to the sacred text bound in human flesh known as the Necronomicon, that our Dark Lord Cthulhu rests in his sunken city of Rilia on a giant pile of money? Well, if you don't want to see the world devolve into a black abyss of gibbery madness, or you just want to support our show, go ahead and head over to Patreon. You can find that at patreon.com slash alien theorist podcast, or head over to alien theorist theorizing dot live where you can suppress the Dark Lord by buying our merch. Or really stick it to him by leaving us a five star review and subscribing. Thanks a lot. And for Knui Mlknafa, Cthulhu Rilia, Wagnagle Fatagan. Wagnagle Fatagan to you too, Dan. Over 1,000 years ago, Hindu religious texts described an ethereal realm where humans could potentially access information on all that is, was, and will be. A type of interdimensional data cloud where all events from a person's past lives and futures could be viewed. At the end of the 19th century, the Western world saw the rise of spiritualism. Out of this cultural shift, there were figures like Madame Blavatsky, who popularized the search for ancient knowledge within Eastern philosophies to bring spiritual enlightenment to the industrialized world. Even the famed Edgar Cayce, renowned psychic, claimed to have access to these records during his readings on subjects like Atlantis and ancient Egypt. What evidence suggests the existence of these otherworldly data repositories? Are people with certain neurological disorders able to access these records when they acquire certain skills inhumanly fast. How do certain facets of human culture suggest the existence of a collective psychic connection? This case file join the theorists as they load up on crystals and get their interdimensional library cards to check out the Akashic Records. Welcome, brothers and sisters, to another episode of Alien Theorist Theorizing, Case File 150, The Akashic Records, with me, one quarter of your Akashic Record readers tonight, Brayden. And me, Zelstradamus. And I have just attained spiritual oneness, Dan. (laughs) And obviously, it's Andrew the Enlightened. Uh, case file 150. Um, funny story. This one kind of came up. If you're listening to this in order, it's going to be more of a straight theorizing topic. We were supposed to have Elvis on the show for 150. <laughs> it's crazy because we thought we were we had a hot scoop. Elvis was going to tell us that this is all fake, and then we found out it's a, it's not even the real Elvis. <laughs> it's just an impersonator. Ah. We're like, well, why would we want to talk to you? What? The, this is ridiculous. We thought you were Elvis. That's what you <laughs> Only the to real be. Elvis is good enough for ATT. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> that's what happened. If you're keeping track on a notepad, uh, all the conspiracies we've busted, Elvis, still unsolved. Cue it up. Yeah, he's hanging out with Tupac. Oh, every, so, everyone's like 88 years old. What did he be like? 80 something. 80 something for yeah. sure. So he brings us to the new topic of the Akashic Records. A lot of people have actually asked us to to cover this one. It's always it always seems to come up. I know it it comes up a lot in um, I know alien uh, ancient aliens. Blah, it's always on there. Um, a lot of that kind of brought it to the you know forefront of the kind of spiritual oneness. You know, uh, forefront. I guess. <laughs> oh, dude. Doing research for this one was hard because there's like it's a thin line between like you know talking about cool you know alien stuff and Akashic records of how we can all tap into like dream believe achieve like it will sh- the Akashic records will show themselves to you when you need to know and what you need to know at the time you need to know it and Listen. you can ask us it at any time you want but Buddy. if you're not ready to receive you will be denied I'm like I fucking oh God, spent. <laughs> Spent 45 minutes last night 
working on studying for this shit, going through YouTube. And all going I ended up YouTube. with was like about 14 different multi-level marketing schemes selling me essential oils and crystals. <laughs> so hopefully they get here soon. Uh, <laughs> Is that the crystal you're shaking around right now? Right here. Check it Did out. Did you get I that one? Collection. Yeah. I got this one. got this little bastard here. I got this big old one here too. What yeah. are they all good for? Different things or? It must what? be. Uh, well, the, this one's good for... Uh, Yes, saying yes or saying no. Yes and no. And this one, actually, now I'm going to bring with me on the ambulance. And I'm no longer going to use any medical knowledge or skill anymore. I'm just going to use this thing and wave it around. Sprinkle that, little essential oils a, with it as well. Is that a Himalayan pink salt? Pink no, salt lamp? this is an Argentinian healing stone, Braden. Oh, sorry. Oh, it does. Jesus. God. Hey, listen. Sorry oh for getting God. upset. Venus is in retrograde right now. I get a little testy. Yeah. I apologize. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> We'll forgive I understand. You. More or less, the Akashic Records, their origins are kind of straightforward. Uh, Akashic is really the, the adjective word um, taken from the ancient Sanskrit word Akasha, which is a term that refers to either space or ether in the traditional Indian cosmology. Vedantic philosophy, which is one of the six schools of Hindu philosophy, Kind of gives it this technical meaning of like and the ethereal fluid that pervades the cosmos. That's kind of like the the media, like a spiritual medium that everything kind of floats in or kind of a different even on a different kind of plane that's underneath what what you can see, what you can perceive with your physical senses. Like a like an extra dimensional thing. Yeah. Mm. Um it's considered one of the five gross elements, uh, the others being fire, water, air, and earth. Uh, in Hinduism, the the main characteristic is what they call shabda of, uh, of akasha, which is the element of sound. Now, Dan, I, I have to ask you here because it's a little bit confusing for me. I do not remember there being an akashic planeteer. <laughs> So I don't, I just, are you making that up? That's what heart was. I mean, was it? Yeah. Okay. I stand corrected. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, is that why you always, you know, people do the chants and stuff. Of the, they're trying to tap in is, you know, home, that kind of stuff. Is that what the, you're trying to get to when you're uh, meditating like that? Well, uh, I, I guess, yeah, you could see it like that. Something like that. Um the Akashic records itself uh, never really kind of arose to this into the ideology of what, what would now we identify as kind of uh, Western esotericism, uh, which encompasses uh, the, the ideas of what we call, which is also called theosophy, which is a kind of subset of philosophy uh, that believes that, you know, hidden knowledge from the past or wisdom from the past uh, offers the the path to enlightenment uh, for the rest of the world, which, you know, in, <laughs> in some, I would say in some aspects that might be true, you know, I, revisiting <laughs> ideas and concepts that are when you say past. that, it reminds me that about like so many of the material I listened to and watched this line was in it. The Acacia records holds the knowledge of the past. The present and the future. That's ex that's pretty much <laughs> exactly like that. what. Uh, that's what the whole thing pretty much is. Is pretty much like everything that has ever happened is in this record. It's like a you can think of it as like the cloud computing of humanity, I guess, or of life in general. There's some distinctions though between the Akashic records, and if you kind of go into I'm sure people who, if you listen to this podcast, you've probably heard of Edgar Casey, who is the famed psychic astral projector, uh, past life regression specialist. Yeah, uh, gave us all the prophecies about Atlantis and uh, you know reincarnation as Atlantean citizens, all that kind of stuff. Uh, he and one of his kind of readings, I know he made the distinction. He was asked about what's the difference between the Akashic records and what he called the book of life. And he was saying that the Akashic records are more like the records of individuals. Like your person, like everyone has their own Akashic record, pretty much. Right. So, so would that be like similar to like I'm I'm fucking reaching way back to Sunday school here, but like 
when you get to the pearly gates and then they crack open that big book of your life and we, they sit down and they review everything with you and you're like, you started masturbating way too young. You're not coming. <laughs> in. Uh, well, the book of life is everything that would technically, uh, I think what Edgar Casey kind of uh, described it as most uh, like the easiest way to describe it is like God's plan for everything. Uh, that's how he kind of described it or concept or conceptualized it. The, uh, the Akashic records again are the individual records of everything that will happen. So not just like your past, present and future, but also your possible past, present, like and all future, all probabilities. Like the Akashic records kind of like ties in similar with like a, like a many, like a multiverse theory in a way. Like a yeah. lot. Right. Yeah. So it would be like a, I think what the, one of the terms that I usually use to to refer to this kind of thing is is called prescience, and the prescience is well, it's taken from Dune, but uh, <laughs> it is seeing all the paths <laughs> laid out before you, so seeing everything. So like Doctor There's, Strange, basically. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. If you had the time stone, I guess you'd you be able to back see everything walk. all at once. Yeah, that that's actually good. Uh, now I understand. It's I the only way. Before. You got to put it. into comic books or some type of pop yeah. culture, and I'm like, oh, okay, I get you. Cool. Well, Dune's going to be pop culture soon since they're coming out with the new movie. So, I, uh, man, I, I tried to watch the first one when I was a kid and it fucked me yeah, up. Yeah, that one's way too weird. Super yeah. weird. Super weird. <laughs> Doesn't hold up. <laughs> no. I don't well, think it ever did it ever. Like, even when it I came don't know. out, was any like. I, I think, think so. I think it's I think it's a good type of weird. I liked it. I, I like it. Well, Dan, good in it. you're our favorite kind of weird. So, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense to us. It's, it's <laughs> interesting. Like when I'm thinking about the Kashuk records and something of that is like holding all this knowledge. I know we've kind of touched on it before, but like it makes me think of the people that get those head injuries and then all of a sudden acquire skills like, you know, extremely well at math, just can solve like the most advanced math problems or the people who have like get like like just musical talents, like all of a sudden sudden savant syndrome. Yeah. And they're just like savant syndrome. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like so if you're telling me that you can hit a hit your head and scramble and that information is already stored up there somehow and you've just now accessed it like that gives like to me like it makes me believe that more that there is something that we can't see that holds all this knowledge and it's already there we just can't tap into it but think about think about the other people so okay guess Braden gets hit in the head and he's fucking oh, he's we Einstein. all know what happens if I get <laughs> he's yeah. fucking boom he's Einstein Dan gets hit, hit in the head he's a fucking paraplegic yeah Zell gets hit in the head he's got neurological deficits can't feel one side of his body can't use anything. And then I get hit in the head and I turn into fucking Chris Benoit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, how is that a thing? How does that happen? doesn't make sense. How does it vary like that? Because your brain is the receiver for like, like, I guess the Akashic. So there's Akashic records and like the Akashic field is like the connection of everything, like that ether of the universe. So your brain is the receiver of that and it can be rewired on accident by hitting it. Or maybe you hit like if it, no matter how you hit it, it can knock that baby any any which way. So there are benefits to TBIs, just <laughs> not all the time. <laughs> very very infrequently. Yeah. We do know from from studies that have been you know work, worked with people who are uh, you know aff afflicted with savant syndrome, people who have certain yeah. degrees of autism, who display these these amazing talents uh, or these uh, capacities to do things that are uh, generally. Uh, impossible or inconceivable for normal people like you had a uh, is it uh, the guy that they based Rain Man on uh, you know Dustin, Dustin, Dustin Hoffman, Dustin Hoffman. Um, who could tell you who is it Kim Haskins is the guy's name who could tell you you could give him a date and he would tell you the day like he could tell you what day of the week it was. you just gave him a random <laughs> what day date is it? it's Monday <laughs> yeah. you did it <laughs> well if you said like December 13th 1965 <laughs> Oh, and he, then he's like, then he's like, it's it was a Wednesday, yeah, but and it's, he can do that right off the top of his head. You talk about his name's Kim Peak, Kim Peak. Sorry, yeah, but yeah, he was like um, amazing at memorizing over twelve thousand right. books. That guy did. Yeah, he could read a book and completely memorize it with reading it one time. Uh, it, what a lot of uh, you know psychologists and, and neuroscientists say that the savant syndrome is basically that. Most of these people who are affected by savant syndrome have a severe, like a severe deficiency in some other area of their brain and some area of their brain capacity. So even can peak people like that, like they can't even button their own shirts. 
Like they can do math. They can, you know, sight read music. They can do all these things and, and, you know, that they, you know, they can look at an instrument and play it, you know, as, as well as a professional who's done it for 10 years, but then they can't do really basic things like go out and talk to people or, you know, sit down and, and watch TV. And some scientists, you know, the theory is kind of vary where it's like, this is either a deficiency and the brain adapts. It's able to adapt because the brain is extremely adaptable. We do know that. So some part of your brain is, is hindered or, or undeveloped or something like that. And then the other part of the brain kind of uh, compensates for that. Right. So, or they say that these people have access or they're unfiltered. Like they have an unfiltered view of the world, like how your brain, normally your brain processes both like conscious and unconscious information. Uh, like e normally uh, it's like the, I think they kind of put it in terms of like 11 million pieces of information are processed by your unconscious processing abilities. And then your conscious processing abilities are like 40 pieces per second. So your brain is seeing all these things, at, but it, it, it kind of parses the information to what I need to know right now. What patterns do I need to see? What do I need to act on? And then there's all the other information that's out there that it does. It kind of just like puts off to the side, but it, it's still in there. Right. So a lot of, I would see this, I kind of get on board with this theory because a lot of, you know, autistic people, um, like they, they're very hypersensitive, whether it's colors, sounds, things like that, they can be very easily overstimulated. Oh yeah. So they're taking in all this information and they have this unfiltered, you know, uh, but they're able also able to access it. You know, it's kind of like a trade off, I suppose. So the, the, the overreaction to like the stimulus, but you can actually unlock the, like the subconscious part of your brain in order to access information that like average people would never be able to like take back. Well, they're right. hyper, they're hyper attuned to their surroundings, sounds, colors, anything like easily startled. You get, all, you deal with a lot of like anxiety attacks, panic attacks from them, just from like everyday situations, going into a crowded space, hearing a loud noise, you know what I mean? Sends them into like a fucking full blown panic attack. Yeah. But so uh, like now on the topic of like the records though, like what if, like, as I was saying, like the, some people th claim like your brain is like the quantum receiver to like the consciousness of the universe, like the ether. The well, even if we go with like what some of the stuff Bruce Fenton was saying, right. Where it's like, we're stored, like there's like a, a knowledge stored in us, right. From these, you know, whatever he said, started Epi uh, epigenetic memory, like through your DNA yeah. or whatever. I mean, when you say us, I think you need to speak lightly, like, because yeah, I, like Dan us. saying, I have problems getting dressed every day and talking to people and I'm not good at math. So like, maybe I haven't figured out <laughs> my thing yet. Maybe yeah. there's something that I'm really good at that's out there somewhere, but I haven't figured it out yet. So like on the, on the issue of like epigenetic memory, there, there are, I see more of the Akashic records or when people talk about the Akashic records, I more think of the concept of the collective unconscious, which is a, is a thing which was coined by a, Carl a Young? psychologist, Carl Jung. Right. Uh, who was the he worked very closely with uh, Sigmund Freud and was uh, kind of his supposed he was supposed to be kind of his heir to the, the whole tiger psycho. Guy? Yeah. <laughs> he was going to take over the, the tiger zoo. Yeah. They cut. They actually broke. They worked very closely together for like thirty years or something, and then they kind of broke off. Where Sigmund Freud kind of he pushed the the ideas of psychoanalysis, and then Carl Jung uh, founded kind of the the what he called analytic psychology. And he talks a lot about the collective unconscious and and what are known as archetypes. So the collective unconscious is like this uh, is this place in our minds or between everyone where it's kind of populated by instincts and uh, these universal symbols. So you have things like uh, across cultures, you have these symbols or these, uh, you know, uh, objects, which are, uh, can be interpreted the same way by even people who have, you know, you know, very different cultural backgrounds. You have things like the great mother, or the wise old man, the shadow, the tower, water, right. tree of life, pyramids. Now maybe that's maybe that like collective unconscious is like that is where you know someone can pull something from the say you know the the Akashic records or whatnot. But like because has have you guys 
ever experienced, and I'm sure there's other people have, where you, you think of something creative and you don't act on it. And then very shortly, it seems like very shortly after that, something you you were thinking about juggling with is, is now you see it somewhere else and you're like, how the, like I fucking had that idea. I thought of something like that. And now like that it's being created somewhere else. Uh, laser bullets for me. I, I invented <laughs> laser bullets and I didn't act on it. It's on the record and now. now. Yeah. And now there's laser bullets. So you brought that, that in from the laser bullets. Who has laser bullets? So There's laser bullets, laser sight bullet. it was the best idea ever to sight in your gun. You put, it's just a laser pointer that's in the shell of your bullet. You load <sighs> it up, then you, you aim at a target and then you can sight in your sights at a hundred yards. Just in case if you're in the bush, you dropped your gun. I thought you were talking best about idea ever. It's like made of light. Like, like No, no. <laughs> yeah. This is no. way less cool than I thought you were talking yeah. about. Like, yeah. Like, that was like, going to be real I cool. Come up you, with this idea. you thought about taping a fucking laser George pointer George Lucas ripped <laughs> off fucking your idea, put him in Star Wars. <laughs> Yeah, but what you're what you're saying is like you pulled that from the ether, and because yeah. you you pulled that, it's now in the like other people have easier access to it's it. It's in the collective consciousness now. But you because you yeah. pulled, one of you like one person pulled it in, but now everyone is now connected to that idea because it's now part of us. Yeah, that's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. But exactly you, what I'm you saying. have to be somewhat enlightened to be able to crack into. Think that. about okay. how many people. Think about this. Think about how many times a year where a movie will come out and a very similar movie will come out at the exact same time with a near like such similar script that you're like, how are both these movies getting made? How about like songs that sound so similar? You know what I mean? Where it's like they're so. It's that's like called plagiarism. It. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about like what about deja vu then? You know what I mean? Where you're like, I swear I felt this before, but maybe it wasn't you feeling it. Maybe somebody else did, and you're just fucking pulling that from somewhere. Well, if your if your mind's part of like an all knowing, all encompassing network of records that everything's always happened or ha- is, is already happened, sure. Every you could say that about every memory then you have ever had. You could go even farther. You could say if everything you've it's not really you. It's just part of the ether. Dan, was there any was there any reason why uh, Young and Freud fucking split? Like, was it? I, you know what I mean? Like I, I would imagine it would maybe have something to do with the whole Oedipus Rex. Everybody wants to bang their mom thinking that Freud wouldn't get off. And then, well, actually, well, actually that, that, that concept came up as a kind of a point of almost like agreement between them. Oh, like really? that was one of the archetypes. That was one of the archetypes that Carl Jung said that Freud got right. Oh, like, wow. That is actually a, that's a, that's like a universal thing. So, uh, so to say, so to speak. Um, I think they kind of broke, they broke up like on the kind of the ideas of like collective unconscious where it's like, it's, it's the idea that these symbols can be decontextualized or they're related to your personal experience as opposed to that they are universal things between all humans or stuff like that. Right. Like young was kind of of the favor that there was kind of a, that these archetypes are connected to our uh, or our imprints of like momentous or frequently recurring situations in our human past, right? So, a lot humans, because we are of the same species, we all got two arms, we've all got two legs, most of us, anyways. We all have similar experiences across human civilization. Like, it's there, there are certain things that happened there are, you know, very likely to happen to all kinds of humans a long history you know it's it's like we we saw trees like you, you see the sun it's a circle there's symbols that that just go across time and where people kind of say you know well how come everybody has the same concept or the same mythologies or the same stories it's like well because these stories are universally the, the applicable they're relatable the same story over like there's only so many stories to be told almost and so every yeah. culture kind of identifies them relatively similarly yeah, like they're they're either um, yeah. There's so many stories that can be related, but that like the experiences of humans across cultures is is more or less the same. You know, growing up, feeling you know, uh, developing as a teenager, rebellion. Uh, you know, apparently the Oedipus complex is one. I guess no. <laughs> um, uh, it, but even when you think about like you know, sun worship, like uh, uh, these kind of. Uh, what you would call like occult symbolism is like these symbols and things go across culture. They're universally accepted. Like the, the circle, the eye, you know, shadow, darkness, chaos. What about these kinds of things? What about as far back as like instinctual behavior with like, let's say like with fucking neonates, infants, 
You know what I mean? Like just instinctually knowing that once they get put up to a breast to breastfeed. Um, I, I think those, like those kinds of things, those physical things like, uh, are, are what are considered, um, I forget what they're called. There, there was a, there was a name for it. There was an idea for it where you have these kinds of instincts as a, you know, as a physical organism, as a living organism, we all have these kinds of reactions or kind of burnt in, uh, reflexes. And that, that is perhaps one of them. Um, whether it's like, uh, for, for humans, I suppose it might be like the, the ability to kind of, to, to, to fix patterns. Yeah. Like, like when you hold patterns. me over the water, I start to paddle. <laughs> like a dog. <laughs> Our brains, because we're, you know, we are all the same type of creature. We all is more or less the same type of organism. Like our brains all work universally the same. There was a experiment done about uh, like trying to see how people can or, or kind of to go back to like the unconscious pro processing ability where it's like your brain sees everything no matter whether you think you see it or not right so uh there's an experiment where uh a couple of uh, uh a couple of people at the brain and mind institute mind institute of the university of western ontario took this uh these two pictures and they call it like the connected connectedness illusion where you take a group of circles and you can uh, you put them all in one piece of one photo, right? A bunch of unconnected circles. And then you show another picture of the same number of circles, but they're all connected by short lines. Like each one is connected to another by a short line. And people will process the information differently. They will estimate that there are less circles on the one that there are connecting circles. Just strange, right? But when they're given a task to act on the targets, the researchers saw that your brain kind of shifts into this, what they call brain site, where they're able to strategically plan actions that included all of the targets. Weird. Crazy. So Akashic records are real. Yeah, 100%, man. <laughs> That's what I got. Dude, <laughs> Well, like, I, I like to think of it this way, too. Like, I have no musical inclination. Zero. So for me to come up with any kind of, like, like music, I'd be like, boop-a-doo, doop -a doo woo! Like, that's the extent of me creating music. But, like, Zell, someone like you, with a little bit of plastic and honing your, like, honing the craft a little bit, you were able to come up with, like, these unbelievable melodies from, like, you know, just a little bit of time of practicing to use instruments and then you've you like have tapped into a different type of creative process now like i couldn't do that but could i like shouldn't you be able to though if the Kashuk records theory but that's is right that's what i'm saying is, to. is if i took the time like zell to fo he's like focusing his br brain right he's like pinpointing his brain right now of like i need to focus on how to create this process he learns a little bit of i'm super stoned by the way just I, FYI. I, i'm <laughs> loving it i'm loving it keep going so uh he he you know, he learns how to play guitar and make this music. And now he has access to like all this different like musical ability to like create these melodies. Whereas like, yes, maybe I could do the same thing, but maybe not like maybe learning the guitar. I would never get any kind of creative process from, it. I wouldn't be able to tap in like Zell does. So what about, what about the outliers though? You know what I mean? Like Zell can learn to shred and be amazing, but is Zell ever going to be fucking Jimmy page or, Eddie Van Halen? Well, here, hey, well, just wait a minute. Maybe I will. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, no, though. No, right? but like, there's, there's a, this is exactly where my interest in the Kashuk Records goes to the side of music. And that's where I want to get to. But before we go there, let's take a quick beer break. Yeah. Booyah. Hey, everyone. Did you know, according to the sacred text bound in human flesh known as the Necronomicon, that our Dark Lord Cthulhu rests in his sunken city of Rilia on a giant pile of money? Well, if you don't want to see the world devolve into a black abyss of gibbery madness, or you just want to support our show, go ahead and head over to Patreon. You can find that at patreon.com slash alien theorist podcast, or head over to alien theorist theorizing dot live where you can suppress the Dark Lord by buying our merch or really stick it to him by leaving us a five star review and subscribing. Thanks a lot. And for new email, Knafa, Cthulhu, Rilia, Wagnagel, Fatagen. Wagnagel, Fatagen to you too, Dan. All right, we're back.
All right, Enlighten Zell, you were just about to get into the Acacia Records and some music. Okay, well, you just before Muzak. the break, just before the break, you're saying, like, why, like, why did I, like, I learn guitar and I write these songs, and like, so, so I couldn't, and you, you couldn't, but well, maybe you could, but you haven't. Yeah, and so for I, me, did you do a little? Co- didn't Brayden do a little ghostwriting? Can I jump in? Didn't he do a little ghostwriting? I think he yeah, did. but here's the thing. I was working with Zell, who's tuned in okay. to the Acacia Records. So you guys did a little fucking lit a couple candles and did a little kumbaya before you wrote. <laughs> yeah, God yeah. Did you guys pull out, Yeah, you guys pulled up your crystals. Yeah, crystals, you user. name it. Yeah, All the inspiration we could take. Yeah. Braden is yeah. credited on one song. Yeah, that nice. is no longer being played, but it was no. It was one of the first songs I wrote when I started music again back like what five years ago. So. Like the thing for me with like why am I playing music and why are some people not? That's from that's for me with like the Kashuk records and like that theory of like how I think about it. It's almost I read this book, it was called uh The War of Art. And it, it just talks all about this. I can't remember what off the top of my head, I can't remember the author's name. But it's like why it's pretty much for me as why did I start playing music? That that first thought, like why, what, like what leads people down like a route? Like when I was like twelve, I just started playing guitar. I was like, I We're didn't rebellious really... youth. You wanted to dye your hair black and be in yeah, but that was I wasn't band. really rebellious. That's just fun. <laughs> <laughs> I seen pictures, man. I seen them. Oh, I'm not denying. I did have black hair for about two weeks, and then my roots grew in, and it looked like my hair was floating above my head. Guy's got fucking AFI and my chemical romance <laughs> posters all over his room. I seen it. Yeah. <laughs> I never had any band posters, but anyways, what was I talking about? Oh, the so like for me, the like K records are like some type of something outside of yourself, like pushing you to do something. So like for me, like I as and as musicians, like a lot of musicians will tell you like where like if you try if you write a song, say I just like grab my guitar. I, I'm ver- like I'm well practiced. I know how to play it, and I know like what notes go together. But when you write something, it like it never seems like you did it. Like a lot of people who say they write books or they write music, they just like inspiration just strikes you, and then you write it. Like it just comes out of somewhere. And so, for, like in the book, The War of Art, they talk about like, well, he calls them like the muse, right? Like the ancient, like the myth of like like the Greek mythology. Like Zeus's kids or whatever, the nine muses, and they're all yeah. about the arts and creativity. So for me, I always think about like, because we've talked about like simulation theory and like maybe this is like, maybe we're being controlled. And for me, I've always thought like, imagine you're the creator or you're like the person pr- programming this. You're the muse, the muse of art. I can't remember what the, what the God was. Because there's nine, nine muses and, and pretty much what, they're like they're creating stuff through me. Like we're we're the we're the end beacon. That's how. So when people say the Akashic records and like music, for me personally, it's like, well, what made me start playing music, and why can I write? Why do I write songs how I write them? Because music. Because Dan said like we're all pretty much identical, like on like our brains and how we work, but art and creativity seems to be so like wildly different. So biologically, I would say biologically, we are very similar, but I think that was also one of what Jung kind of said about the collective unconsciousness is that our, what differs very wildly, like you've already said, is that our cultural backgrounds, like our social backgrounds, like where we come from, our experiences as individuals also come into play, right? So I, I like when you started playing music, you started playing at what, 12, right? Did you get your own guitar? Did you buy it? No, I didn't buy my first one. No. But did somebody buy it for you? Well, my dad would have bought my first one. But at first, I just used friends' guitars for a while. And then I would eventually okay. get my old one. And was it fun? Did you enjoy it? Oh, of course. Right. So, I mean, normally, like, things that we like to do and we enjoy doing, it does. And I would say that, and I'm not trying to say that the Muse stuff isn't happening or that that's not a possibility. But it's like when you have something that you you're you're good at. And you know you practice a lot because I mean, Braden, how many t- how many how much have you practiced on the guitar? Uh, an embarrassing amount <laughs> for how little skill I have, to be honest. As much as Zell? 
No, God no. But I don't get any. <laughs> j- I don't. I don't get any joy from the level of difficulty that, like that, the practice of that requires. I think that just speaks to your worth he- ethic, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what it is. I'm so good at everything I do that when I yeah. find something that I'm like not good nah, at, I'm yeah, like, well, I'm yeah. never doing this again. I'm not. I'm not immediately good at this. Well, I mean, um, whoever, like Zell, if you can crack into this, like we we think you can, because obviously by the look of your live stream, you're very enlightened. Aww. Can you speak yep. to whatever Muse is talking to fucking Tra- Chad Kroger and Nickelback and tell them to stop, or maybe like get a new one? <laughs> I love some Nickelback. fucking different Dude, music. I don't know. They're the biggest selling band of the modern of the modern era, so they're doing something right. Unfortunately, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, at Dan's point, though, I guess you when you do stuff that's fun, you continue to do it. And I'm like, but I, guitar was not my most skilled thing. But guitar is the one thing. Like music's the one thing that the older I get, the more I focus on. Right, and you've you but you've learned. And you have, you've spent countless hours listening to music, a lot of different genres of music, I assume. Like you're always, when we load up on podcasts, you're always listening to music. Like you're always listening to music and like, you know how to, you have experience kind of taking songs apart, I'm sure. Like you listen to certain songs, like, Hey, that sounds good. Like, you know, and you can kind of take those apart and eventually, like I said, or like we've said, like your brain is processing all of that music all the time, everything about music. But that like th- that even leads credence to the fact that like he's just more in tune to like this aspect of like the global like the universal consciousness because you could say that with like each one of us has a different interest that we're better at that we focus in on more and it just it's like a natural you don't know why you do it you just do yes I mean so it comes down to classic nature versus nurture. I would say that's where it kind of boils down to how whether whether are you good at music because you practice at it and you have an you have a you have a vested interest in it and and you like to yeah or is it innate what like so what I was gonna say too like what you what you're speaking on I have obviously like I can't even play the fucking recorder I couldn't even play hot crush buns I was terrible at it they (laughs) took it away from me they thought I was joking and I wasn't joking I was just that fucking terrible but what about like for me the times I've experienced this is in sports. Where like whether, you know what I mean? Like I've been sparring or, you know what I mean? How to fight. And I'm, you know what I mean? You get back in the corner and I'm like, I don't remember anything that just happened. And your corner's like, how the, like, you know what I mean? That, that three, two, three slip three that you threw, like was amazing. Like, how did you do that? And be like, I don't even remember. I don't know. Like it just, it's all reaction. Your subconscious takes over. Well, and you usually, you usually attribute it to like muscle memory or something like that, but maybe it's not muscle memory. Well, it could be, it could be part of training because I, I know I've watched a couple, whatever, uh, a couple of, you know, TV shows about boxing where they talk and they go into like the specifics. I know TV shows about boxing, but like they go into the specifics. I've seen a couple movies, boxing. but yeah. no, but talking about that concept of like, are the, mo- when you are training, like you, you could say it's muscle memory, but you could also say that it's your unconscious mind is also slipping into those patterns. It's rearranging those patterns and being but like, dude, if I see that, this happening, you, there's people that are natural talents. There's people, Dan, there's people that can walk in. There's people that can walk into whatever you're good at. One thing that you think you're good at, there's a person out there that can walk in and on their day one, they're just so naturally inclined to do it that they're better on your day on their day one than you are at like day a hundred of practicing. And you're just like, how? And it's just <laughs> they're wired to do it. Like there's something they're tapped into something else where their brain is connected, just how you're supposed to move and the mechanics of it way better. I've seen it so many times. I've seen it with lacrosse. I've seen it with well, exactly. you no know, like, skateboarding, right? I've seen it with so many things where you just, there's people that it's like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fairly good lacrosse player, but there's people that I watch on the floor and do the things they do. And I go, there is no amount of practice. <laughs> I, and I'm such a practice player. If you came and watched me practice, you'd be like, this guy's a superstar. And then I get to the game and I'm like, meat and potatoes. But that should make sense because I practice the cool stuff in practice. I never execute it in the game. Yeah. And there's people that like don't do nothing, smoke weed, and will show up. And it's like you're watching a magician out there. Like 
Yeah, it just doesn't make sense. Like yeah. I've seen it. I've seen it with my eyes, Dan. I've seen people do this shit. <laughs> but you could also chalk everyone it up knows. To- everyone knows those next people that are just next level. Like even bas- think about basketball players, hockey players, like all those like guys that are just next level. Like they're just. Yeah, and I would say you're referencing a lot of like anecdotal evidence from sports, which it could be that's a product of they just have superior hand-eye coordination. No, <laughs> no, that's not true, Dan. <laughs> You know this what thing, though? Like, but there's the, the thing about that though is the thing that blows my mind is like, okay, so you have your average fucking Joes, like people like us who have played sports, played to a certain level, and and didn't make it any farther. And then you have professional athletes who are playing at the highest level of sports, who are fucking amazing, who make other athletes look, you know, like jokes. And then even on those teams, you have two or three players that make everybody else look like fucking children (laughs) on this team. That is like the best team in the fucking, like this is the highest pinnacle of sports. And yet you have two or three guys that just make it look like there's a fucking cheat code going. You know what I mean? Like it it doesn't make any sense. Like you look at a guy like Kelvin Johnson, all time, great fucking Detroit line. Of course. Of course. Nobody could cover that fucking guy. (laughs) Nobody. It's it's just, you know what I mean? Like some people like, I, I I disagree with the handout. Like some people are just inclined to some people. It's like watching them perform music. Like they're just so creative in how they move and the things they do and the, the looks like it's, you can see it. It's like, it's the, like they just, you know, they've tapped into something else and it Barry has Sanders. nothing to do with the actual, like me, like for football, like catching, passing, you know, running there's, but there's a ne- next level where they just understand like, Oh, if I can do this and they're so creative about it. And that is always so interesting to me because I'm like, how, like, is that just, they're, they're just tapped into something else. There's something else they've got. So I would, I would chalk, I would also chalk that up to what genetics, is, what we normally call imagination. And so scientists have kind of been able to... I, I haven't been dreaming this. <laughs> I know. Scientists have been able to kind of uh, conceptualize the, what they call like a mental workspace. They've kind of been able to identify within our brain. There's like this neural network that coordinates our activity, uh, like our activity of everything that we're doing across multiple regions of the brain. All right. So um, like in 2013... Uh, uh, there was an experiment done at Dartmouth College with a like about like a couple participants, like uh, like fifteen people, and they gave them these they gave them these pictures of like certain shapes, like just just random shapes, and they kind of they they wanted them to uh, it's kind of like an exercise in like mental manipulation where they would involve the visual cortex, so like you're processing visual information, and then they would take those. And then they would kind of like ask them to either recall those those shapes or rearrange those shapes into like different shapes. And so they found that even when they were when they were manipulating this, these imaginary shapes, it wasn't just one part of their brain that was doing it. There were actually 12 regions of interest that they identified and they saw differences in brain activity uh, when they compared it to like control conditions Right. So there's like the like the idea of this mental workspace that there are different parts of your brain all working at the same time, but they're not necessarily the same in every person. I mean, like I know that they did a similar thing with Donald Trump and he got it right. And matter of fact, he still remembers it. Woman, People, child, woman, microwave, child. dog, car. <laughs> the fuck that was. <laughs> okay, well. So I get like obviously what Dan's saying makes a lot of sense to perceive like I thought only way only way that's scientifically kind of like testable in any way right but I guess when people talk about the cash records and they start going like energy and frequencies and the, that's when you get into all the crystals and stuff but if you look like some of it definitely seems silly and I'm not saying I'm like I'm going searching for my Akashic record <laughs> but I'm saying like we exist in this very tiny if you're going with like frequency right? You know, because mu- music and like light frequencies and like they're all interconnected pretty much. So if you're going with frequencies and we exist in this tiny little sliver of the spectrum, like invisible light is what we can perceive. And then our instruments can, you know, we can detect all the other waves. But I guess what the Akashic records, I guess, are saying like we're existing in this ether of something we don't understand. And when people say like, I was just 
the when people bec become compelled to do something, people who believe in the Kashuk records believe that almost, you know, you're, I don't like it because it's like, it takes away like you're being signaled or you're being controlled by like a different place to do something to appease the being in the next dimension, I guess is what some mm. people say. So like you are like, well, fuck that guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fuck. Dude, my guy is, my guy's pretty easy going. He doesn't yeah, want a lot. Slacking. No, but that's, that's the myth. That's the myth of the, of, of the muses. Like they exist. They're the beings, the next dimensional beings, and they take, pride and joy when you create something that speaks to their like the if you're an artist there's the, there's one muse if they're a painter if you're a builder even if think about this podcast right like what's what's been our driving force like this podcast at the beginning only got more difficult to do and we kept doing it like obviously you know it's be, it's better now and it's worked up but like there was a time when we first started where I still don't really know why we were doing it other than like <laughs> we should just do it like in our first year, think about our first year, how much changed in the first year where I moved away, right? Everyone was separated. Oh, but for man. some reason, we just kept doing it. Yeah, and the, you could say like, yeah, it was fun for us and we enjoyed doing it. Or if you go with the uh, more metaphysical, we are being like, we're we're just a lower dimensional being being controlled by some type of yeah. fucking... And so, <laughs> someone wants to listen to some shit. <laughs> Talk about My aliens, fucking... it makes me feel good. My yeah. muse has been on sabbatical for about 32 years so far. So <laughs> I'm ready for that guy to come back and start fucking inspiring yeah. me. Yeah, he uh, he's on vacation. He'll be back. Apparently. Fuck. So moral of the story, listeners, there's no reason to be impressed by Zell's musical talents or Dan's intelligence. Yeah. It's nope. all the fucking Akashic records. Yeah. Well, they've been pulling it. They've been cheating. Practice. Yeah. Really. They've been pulling. <laughs> uh, Zell, did you want to? Did you have an activity you wanted to do? Oh no! We sh uh, if we want to get into the Akashic records, all the stuff I could find on it involved meditation and other so something you can't do on a podcast. So. Oh man, I've been trying. Oh, okay. I got too much ADD. <laughs> Maybe for a live stream. But so next right, time, well, then next time we do Pod Week, I think we can try some of the stuff in the float tanks. Oh, um, let's do it. I mean, that seems like the best. If you're going to try and tap into something fucking metaphysical, ether Akashic record, the float tank and, that, and deep meditation is where you're going to do it sooner than later. And maybe. And maybe a couple grams of mushrooms. I don't know. <laughs> that could all help. Yeah, I need it. <laughs> um, all right. Well, why don't we get into some... Nice news! No longer in the shadows. UFOs are real, people. We haven't talked about it on the main show yet, but UFOs are real. Yep. New York Times article... Th was it two and a half years since their first one about the ATIP program? Now they're claiming. Yeah. Their <laughs> UFOs are out there. Maybe they have a craft. It's it's a crazy one because, you know, they said they, the classic move, I, I don't think it surprised anyone when they're like, you know, when they we said we told, took ATIP down and we, and we stopped funding it, we shut her down. Everyone's like, yeah. And they're like, we didn't really. We just moved it into another department, kept it going. And everyone's like, no big surprise there. I think everyone... <laughs> <laughs> that's their classic move but interesting stuff to i can't wait to see what um what gets released next do you guys think we're in some sort of soft disclosure here well i don't know the the one quote that got everyone up in arms me included i don't i'm not going to put a whole lot of stock behind it because they've kind of been saying it for a while but eric w davis the astrophysicist who was the subcontractor for the ufo program uh he is quoted of saying off-world vehicles not made on this earth is there they're in possession. Quote from the New York Times article. I don't know exactly how far to take it, but cool. Wild times, man. Wild times. Wild man. times. We'll keep we'll keep listening. Listen. <laughs> yeah, I saw that quote. The only thing I have about that quote is like it's a really short one and it's one of those ones that they could have easily taken out of context. Like, it's just like, it could have been before that. There's like three extra words where it's like suspected <laughs> materials. From yeah. Or before that, there's a quote like, where he's like, well, this is something that I'll never say. You're never going to hear out of me <laughs> that we. <laughs> so I would, I, I, that's what I feel uneasy about is that quote. But, you know, again, then again, I, I don't know. But that guy hasn't come out and said anything against it. And they already, they actually, uh, they submitted a, a correction for the, that New York Times article, like the day after they made some corrections to it, but they didn't address the Davis quote. So I'm assuming that's accurate uh, until they say something different. So 
they say they're going to release some findings from the A-tip. Doesn't necessarily mean Wild. it's going to be like, hey, we got fucking aliens, everybody. It's going to be it'll black be something pages. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, everything's going to be redacted. I got to say sorry to Tom Could DeLong. Be. Tom yeah, DeLong. So far, you told us. I mean, it's looking. <laughs> Looking more and more like he was uh, wasn't bullshitting us. Um, Bob and Doug are back, baby. Woo! Uh, Bob and Doug on board the new Dragon or uh, SpaceX Dragon uh, spaceship uh, have made it back safely to Earth. They came into the atmosphere. Um, what was it, August first uh, or July thirty first? It was and today. Landed. Uh, oh, the, sorry. Was it today? Landed today. Yeah. Yeah, I saw yeah, them pulling the pod onto the onto the ship and everything. It was pretty neat. So monu- monumental. Look like a big old roast marshmallow. It does. That's cool though. So uh, first private yeah, spacecraft is... to go and return from low it, Earth orbit. And it's so nice that I was like, I was so worried that whole time that something would go wrong because if anything went wrong, you knew it was going to kind of stifle any future missions, uh, you know, for for quite a while. So it's now that this is, you know, everything was successful. I I hope they really ramp up. Would nice to be kind of see some more stuff, more of us going to space, and I want to see this Mars mission come to fruition soon. Um, soon. What else do I have here? Um, U.S. has accused Russia of firing an anti-satellite weapon in space. Is the movie was the movie was the TV show Space Force just a documentary? <laughs> that was China. That was China. That oh, was it China in there? Yeah, oh, okay. it was China, not Russia. Mm. Um, now, Dan, did you know anything about? Did they were they? Was it that they fired like a weapon into space that is capable of shooting anti satellites, or did they have a weapon up there that they've shot, or did they use it to shoot a satellite down? I think they accused them of being like this. This thing that they're firing into space is possibly. A satellite killer like it's might be designed to do that but i don't think they're 100 percent sure could they you imagine could you imagine 2020 by the end of 2020 there's just a satellite war and everyone blows each other's satellites out of the out of space causing the we cascading have no more satellites causing a cascading series of destruction known as um the kepler effect Kessler, I think, or Kepler. Kessler effect. Kessler, yeah. Ke- Kessler effect, where they go cascading one satellite into the next, causing a chain reaction, rendering space travel moot. Impossible. Yeah, <laughs> cannot go to space. <laughs> well, anymore. I, I don't think any country would really want it because I think technically that's considered an act of war. I'd say so. And also, like, you wouldn't want to disrupt your own country's yeah, but if you, communications Dan, or if satcom you, okay, systems. Here's the thing: if imagine this for a second. You you are you are Russia. You have all your own satellites in space, and you're like, we can fucking decimate these other countries if we just kind of get set up and just uh, like just destroy all other satellites, like in like a single act of war. I mean, just, this would be what simultaneous. A sim- it is improbable, but not impossible, I suppose. But a simultaneous destruction of all a, of a country. Okay, well, I'm not saying not, I'm not hard. saying it would happen instantly, but maybe it's like systematically. Like right now, they start and they're just like, "Oh, Russia's in an act of war. They're shooting down our satellites because it's like, are you going to fire missiles on Russia? Like, well, no, they're not really attacking us, but they're shooting their satellites but down. It, like this would fucked. be the like fifth fucking act of war that they've gotten away with in the last how many years? <laughs> Like, yeah, I right. don't think that's I something mean, they they're te- opposed technically, to. Technically, they haven't really got away with this stuff because they are under a lot of economic and political sanctions. And yeah, if but you ramp those working. up a bit more, <laughs> they should be under a lot more. But we, uh, somebody's been being pretty soft on them lately. They're still so, putting bounties on yeah. fucking U.S. soldiers and invading fucking countries. And <laughs> um, do we have any other space news? Uh, I I one piece a little cool oh, news cool. Uh, that yeah. they posted when they were talking about disclosing uh, findings or, or projects from the uh, from the UFO thing. This this article popped up a few days or just a few days ago where the CIA revealed the details of this drone that they had from the 1970s. And it's a it is a it's a um, propeller driven drone and it's with only like a 10 foot wingspan. But it was designed to be atomically powered. Like it would, it would fit a nuclear propulsion system and it would be able to operate, um, out of area 51. And it had like, it in the seventies. 
Yeah, they had this thing in the 70s. It was so called uh, Project what do they have now? Aquiline. Yeah, exactly. Like, that what was do we not thought. know was, they have now? Like, fuck. And, and this was built This was built by the same company, uh, McDonnell Douglas. And McDonnell Douglas also designed another aircraft like back in the 90s called the A-12 Avenger, which they called the Flying Dorito, which is very, like, if you look it up, A-12 Avenger, it is just a triangle. Like, it's, they call it the Flying Dorito. So it's just this huge flying triangle built by the same company. You know, it was, it was set to be like a jet, you know, a jet stealth bomber, uh, more or less. And then some other stuff happened and they never went into full production. But they had this drone in the 70s. It was a radio control unmanned drone in the 70s. And if that's what they did in the 70s, like what could, what that's do they have just, now? Just they have stuff now. that they got, they never built, they built five prototypes and it never got to full production. But this is just the one, you know, these are the fucking, the, the throwaway projects what are the ones that yeah, actually, what actually made out? it you know that's what i want to know but i thought that was really cool like the article came out about it. i was like wow that is freaking crazy that you built that in the in the 70s what's what's the what's the one they built in area 51 the stealth bomber oh, oh, yeah. the b12 or the the b12 yeah is that the one they or the b2 was... sorry b2 or are you talking about the sr71 the ones SR, they built like they area 51 was like the yeah. a12 ox what was it the ox car? Yeah, and the like SR-71. the first like ones that can travel like sixty thousand feet or whatever and yeah, spy the, as the Blackbird. So like those ones, like I, I had been, I'm reading a book right now that's kind of talking about that kind of stuff. And like from the sounds of that, even though that stuff was like, like cutting edge, they were fighting to get funded because they were like, like no fund us, like fund us, like if we get cut, like that's it, we can't make any more of these planes. Like this is revolutionary. Come on, you need to fund us. And they like they were struggling to get those planes funded, and there was a, actually a point in time where they thought the pro- the whole project was gonna collapse. And I'm, it's like I'm like like you're saying like if that's the case, I'm like man, like it's kind of weird, like a political thing of like there's all these people with like these breakthroughs that are fighting for funding. Yeah, it's like, and this was a CIA like drone. It was built like the, it was gonna be built for the CIA, and this is just a CIA. Like, what are you know? This is probably somebody's little like pet project kind of thing but it's like what if they were building stuff for like the air force like if they had oh, the bigger man. budget of the air force but, uh, what are they actually you know what else is out there i don't know but i thought that was really cool it popped up a few days ago and i was like this is really neat <laughs> they have anti-gravitic craft now and that's what most maybe that's what all ufos are now maybe it's just the next gen technology 30 years or silent jet engines or something like it would just be silent something crazy like that yeah some type of thermal stealth too like doesn't give off yeah. any heat source yeah or... like a yeah a thermal stealth material as opposed to just the radar stealth material like yeah, it so absorbs like... heat as opposed to radar yeah. stuff like that'd be neat and that's where Could like be. that's where a lot of those they show them in infrared and actually it doesn't show like an exhaust or anything and maybe it's just it's just that well hidden from like normal like regular thermal cameras maybe yeah. maybe still could be damn cool any other space news I think that's it for the week. Mm-hmm. Well, why don't you fire up the old randomatron She's and fixed. Uh, let's see what it's got today. Here we go. UFO. Oh, yeah. All greased up. Oh, nice. Look at this. Spit. This is it's spitting out a it's spitting out a case file from the old UFO encyclopedia. Oh from back shit! In the day. So this throwback. Is, shit. It's throwback. been a while since we've had one of these. All right, uh, Roy Blanchard uh, on the sixteenth of July, nineteen sixty three. Farmer Roy Blanchard discovered a massive crater in one of his fields at Manor Farm, Charlton. This event, which attracted considerable media attention, became known as the Charlton Crater. Oh shit! Oh, According no, to the descri- yeah. <laughs> According to the description given, the ground appeared to have been scooped out as if by an enormous spoon. <laughs> big I- big space I- big spoon. Old- <laughs> space ice cream scoop. Uh, Mr. Blanchard was in no doubt that the depression was firm- formed by the landing of a spaceship. Uh, as he stated, I didn't actually see it. But what else could it have been? <laughs> Obviously, some craft from outer space since it sucked out my barley and potatoes when it took off. 
Oh, that's interesting. Bastards. So as it's gone, like all the all the plants and stuff are also gone. Um, oh, the bomb disposal squad. The bomb disposal squad <laughs> arrived. Well, I wasn't sure if I went. It, the pages were kind of stuck together. I, I was like, is this the right page? I love the UFO encyclopedia. Uh, the Best. bomb disposal squad arrived on the scene and undertook some investigation, which turned up what appeared to be iron meteorite, which Ooh. may well have been the cause of the crater. However, the investigation was somewhat diverted by the comments of an Australian expert. He believed that on the basis of this damage to a potato and barley field, which had not been witnessed by anybody, he was able to conclude that it had been caused by a flying saucer 500 feet wide, weighing 600 tons, and holding a 50-man crew originating from somewhere around Uranus. <laughs> This guy's this guy's obviously what? fucking what? This I was like, how did he? It's like iron meteorite or five hundred foot <laughs> UFO with a fifty man. What? All the guy did was like bend over in the crater, grab a little piece yeah. of dirt, taste Tasted a little it. bit of it, yeah. Yeah. sprinkle oh, it down. Saw where it went in the wind. He's like, this is what happened. Like, fifty, 50 man crew. Walk. You're from Uranus. <laughs> he he he. Then looks at the site. He looks up at the sky. Like okay. Well, based on the 45 trajectory. 45 men. 45 men. Yeah. No, wait, sorry. 50 man mm. crew. <laughs> yeah. 50 man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he My went apologies. on to add, we think their mission is peaceful and exploratory. <laughs> Tastes like Uranus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, he said that they did. They, uh... We think their mission is peaceful and exploratory. They may they may well be worried or curious about our atomic explosions, for their stability may depend on ours. They are not more than a hundred years ahead of us scientifically. The type of craft to which we have evidence is a kind which we can comprehend and will quite likely be making ourselves in a century. An impressive analysis for one hole in the crown. <laughs> very, <laughs> yeah. very impressive. I like that. Extremely impressive. I like to think he's just... We're just mm. tasting the dirt in the ground. Yeah, he, he, he moves away and he picks up some rock, drops them, clicks them together and he goes, 100 years ahead of us scientifically. <laughs> no, yeah, he ate a piece of that. He absorbed a little bit of a little bit of the epigenetic memory from the rock, which was from the craft, <laughs> which led him all the way back oh. through the Kashuk records to this the, is the fucking was it, person. was it Tektite or whatever the fuck that shit's called? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it could have been. Well, there hey, you go. Maybe. Shout out to Bruce Fenton. I was listening. Well, there was bro. no silicon, so I don't. I was know. listening. They just said iron. All right, uh, Zell, you got some new Patreons. I got some new ones. If you get on that Patreon, get on there. Get on there. Alien. Get on there, brother. Patreon.com slash alien theorists. Join us for after hours after every show and a bunch of bonus stuff. This week we got Marvel FFX, Stephen J. Oh, yeah. Hendricks Jr., Christopher Stewart, J. Roddy Rod, Madeline Gray, Brock Awesome, Dimitri M., and Not a Cap. That's it for this week. Thank you very cool. much for supporting the show. We appreciate it. Love you guys. And stay tuned. Um, probably around after July or August 7th, we are going to have the double up meat draw that we've promised because we missed the last meat draw. Yeah, we're one month behind, so we're going to have a more epic dual meat draw. Double the meat. Double, double the meat. <laughs> double the double meat. Double for both hands. Yeah. Um, anything else before we go? I think that's it. All right, guys. As we always say at the end of these things, keep those eyes on the skies. Peace. Hey everyone, did you know, according to the sacred text bound in human flesh known as the Necronomicon, that our Dark Lord Cthulhu rests in his sunken city of Rilia on a giant pile of money? Well, if you don't want to see the world devolve into a black abyss of gibbery madness, or you just want to support our show, go ahead and head over to Patreon. 
You can find that at patreon.com slash alien theorist podcast or head over to alien theorist theorizing dot live where you can suppress the dark lord by buying our merch or really stick it to him by leaving us a five star review and subscribing. Thanks a lot. And flick new him and knaffa Cthulhu really a wagnagle photogen. Wagnagle photogen to you too, Dan.